welcome to another edition of Synoptic Gospels with Life Pacific University Online. I'm Professor Ryan Litton, and today we're going to be talking about the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke wants to write to just everybody. Uh, he's uh, the most historically informed. His Greek is the most polished out of the three of them, and uh, he definitely wants everyone to know that Jesus is their savior, regardless of religious background or ethnicity. And so for, for Luke, Jesus is the savior of the world. Um, what to expect here? Um, like we have with the other gospels, we're going to apply a comparative method to our study of the gospel of Luke. We'll see how Luke is especially concerned with how salvation moved from the Jewish people to the Gentiles. And Luke's really keen to show that Jesus is a Jewish prophet. And so even though uh, the focus is on Jesus as the uh, the Messiah to everyone, the, the Savior to everyone, uh, he definitely wants to give this a Jewish context, uh, that the salvation came out of uh, the Jewish people. So, uh, the Gospel of Luke is fairly clearly Greco-Roman biography. Um, it is written anonymously, like the other two Gospels, uh, Synoptic Gospels, all four of the Gospels, in fact, are written technically anonymously, because uh, none of them include uh, an explicit uh, name for the author. Um, and it, so it's written sometime probably between 80 and 85 CE. I notice I use CE here. Um, some people uh, like to hold on to AD. Um, for me, uh, it's just not a hill I'm, I'm will to die on. Um, there are lots of people in this discipline uh, at secular universities, etc., who are uh, really keen on using BCE and CE before the Common Era and the Common Era. And so... Um, um, I'm happy to just use BCE and CE instead of BC and AD, uh, BC being before Christ, AD being Anno Domini on the year of our Lord. Um, and so uh, if that bothers you, I apologize. Uh, but uh, just so you're aware, that's what that is. And that's that's my conviction for why I'm using it is, you know, sometimes I, I do these presentations for, for mixed audiences and I'm not interested in offending somebody over a couple of letters. So... Uh, Luke is a part of a two-part work, uh, which uh, concludes with the Acts of the Apostles. And so Luke's first volume is the Gospel, and the second volume is the Acts of the Apostles. Authorship for Luke uh, is pretty uncontested, uh, that there is a uh, likely a converted Gentile named Luke who wrote this, uh, that he is a companion of Paul, and that he wrote both the Gospel and Acts. Uh, this is a terribly debated. Um, Luke's knowledge of Judaism and Hebrew scriptures seem to indicate that he is uh, someone who may have been uh, a convert to Judaism from uh, paganism or some other Gentile religion uh, previously, and that he then becomes uh, a messianic follower uh, shortly thereafter. There's not a lot of explicit evidence for this, but it seems likely. Um, and so this is something that we should keep in mind when we're reading uh, reading Luke. We're not completely sure um, when uh, Luke wrote his gospel. Uh, it's not completely certain. Uh, about uh, AD 62 uh, is seemed to be favored by some. Uh, mid to late 60s, if Luke follows Mark, uh, and perhaps written shortly after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, I notice here I've switched to uh, AD from CE. Uh, this is just, I've, I've forgotten to update these this particular slide, and so uh, made a big deal about it just a second ago, and here I am violating my own rule. So. <laughs> uh, but if I were using this slide at a, in sort of like a mixed company, I would make sure to go through and edit it so that we would have uh, consistency throughout. So. Occasion and narrative purpose. Uh, Luke is writing specifically to someone called Theophilus. Uh, some claim that this is a generic term for believers because Theophilus means beloved of God or lover of God, something like that. It's likely that it's an individual, though, uh, probably actually a patron. And so what this would mean is that this is someone who bankrolled uh, Luke's work so that Luke would be able to write these books. Uh, and so if you remember from Cultures of Ancient Civilizations, which is a prerequisite for this course, uh, 
Patronage was pretty common in the ancient world, and so if you were an artist, it wasn't uncommon for you to have people who were supporting your artwork uh, financially, and this would gain them honor publicly, and it would give you an opportunity to draw an income so that you could continue doing your artwork. Even though uh, we know that it's specifically written for Theophilus, it's probably intended for a wider audience, and uh, it's pretty confident that he intended this to be um, circulated, you know, for other people to read it. Literary features, Luke's Gospel is the longest book in the New Testament by far. Luke and Acts together are the most material by any New, New Testament author. Uh, people will often say that Paul wrote most of the New Testament. This is technically incorrect, depending on how you, you count the body of material. Uh, Luke wrote most of the, gospel, most of the New Testament uh, as it pertains to uh, words, um, but... Uh, Paul wrote most as it pertains to uh, individual works. It just, just so happens that his individual works were much smaller than Luke's two works, uh, which are much longer. And so, so Luke actually is the, uh, the primary author of the New Testament. There's a pretty uh, clear unity between Luke and Acts, um, that we have a, a clear two-volume work. Um, the narrative that begins with Luke um, doesn't really conclude until the end of Acts. Um, and uh, basically, you know, uh, Jesus works his way towards Jerusalem, and then the church works their way from Jerusalem. So it's, it's a sort of a what's referred to as a chiasm, right? I, I showed you this in one of the earlier lectures, um, that it sort of works its way down and then works its way back out, geographically speaking. So... Uh, literary style, uh, Luke demonstrates an impressive literary skill. His his Greek is incredibly uh, well done, and uh, when you start to learn New Testament Greek, if any of you decide to do so, um, you uh, you probably want to give yourself some time before you try to <laughs> read anything of Luke's. It's, it's definitely challenging. His prologue is very fine literary Greek, and then he switches in the birth story to sort of a Semitic styling, uh, which gives him some credibility regarding whether or not uh, his uh, birth story is something that he's sort of made up or something that he's pieced together. Uh, there seems to be some decent evidence that uh, Luke may have even uh, interviewed uh, Mary. Uh, after, all, Luke, uh, <laughs> after all, Luke does tell us uh, that Mary treasured these things in her heart. And how would he know this apart from actually being able to, to talk to her? And so, uh, so it seems like this might be uh, something that's happened. Luke's portrait of Jesus, uh, the Savior of all people. He has two very important titles uh, for uh, Jesus, and those are prophet and uh, Christ of the Lord. Uh, as prophet, Jesus performs miracles, and uh, there's proclamation of God's word. Jesus' faithfulness leads to his suffering, and his rejection leads to judgment. And this follows the model of an Old Testament prophet. Uh, but also, uh, you have Christ as Lord, and so this is even more important than his role as the prophet. Jesus, Jesus is clearly uh, superior to earlier prophets, especially John uh, the Baptist. And so uh, Luke's surprising climax then is God's salvation through a suffering Messiah. That we have a prophet, but not just a prophet. We have the Messiah. Christ is, uh, after all, the Greek term that, uh, Christos is the Greek term that translates Mashiach, which is the word for Messiah. So anytime you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus the Messiah. And so the idea that you have this prophet who is suffering who is also the Messiah, is is quite a surprising climax. This is uh, very counterintuitive for what Luke's audience would have been, uh, and very counterintuitive for the New Testament in general, right? Very counterintuitive for the first century. They're expecting a triumphant Messiah, uh, and the su suffering servant of Isaiah is a separate entity, right? There's there's no way to reconcile the two, except that there is. Right? And so this, this is counterintuitive for everybody. No one expects this coming. Other characters in the gospel, Jewish uh, leaders, uh, religious leaders, are uh, characterized in Luke's gospel. And they're characterized as self-righteous, uh, especially in the parables. We have the great banquet, refusal of the invitation, the lost sheep, more rejoicing over a, a lost sheep found than over many who don't need to repent. And so, uh, so that's a contrast there. Uh, prodigal son, the older brother won't celebrate. 
and we have the Good Samaritan uh, religious leaders don't stop. However, uh, Luke still sees hope for a righteous remnant uh, contra Matthew, and this sets up for Acts, where we do see uh, several of the religious leaders, uh, you know, at least of which Nicodemus, uh, that is uh, moving on to follow uh, Jesus, right? And so we see Zechariah at the beginning of Luke. Uh, we see Jairus, the uh, synagogue ruler. And then we see Joseph of Arimathea as well, who is a member of the Sanhedrin. So uh, all of these characters show that it is not, uh, there's not an exclusively negative characterization of the religious leaders in the Gospels. Theological themes, uh, we have promised fulfillment of the salvation of God. There's a continuity between Israel's history and Jesus and the church. Um, there's an emphasis on the universal scope of the expanding church. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Luke is uh, keen in the Sermon on the Mount to uh, tell us that this is a sermon on a plain. You know, Matthew has Jesus on a mountain telling Israel how they ought to live, which has echoes of Moses and even Yahweh himself. Uh, whereas Luke wants to tell us that uh, the sermon is coming on the same level as us, right? So they're they're telling this this story in in different ways. Now, it's possible that there's two different sermons. It's possible that they weren't. Uh, but what we see clearly here in Matthew and in Luke is that Matthew wants to emphasize. Uh, the Old Testament connections here, and Luke wants to emphasize that Jesus is reachable by all of us, right? Luke wants us to know that by fulfilling the promises to Israel, Jesus becomes the Savior to the entire world. And so this is the dawn of salvation and the coming of the Spirit, which gives us a natural transition to uh, the book of Acts. And so we have a new uh, age marked by the coming of the Spirit, and uh, this gives us uh, the three main periods periods of the Spirit's activity in Luke and Acts, which are the birth narrative, empowerment for Jesus' ministry, and the continuing presence of Jesus within the church. Like I said, this, this book is emphasizing uh, salvation for outsiders, a new age of reversals. Mary's him, for instance, uh, praises God for exalting the humble and bringing low the mighty. Jesus brings salvation to the low and the outcast. So this is the poor and the oppressed, the sinners and the tax collectors, and the Samaritans as well. As you can see in this image, this is a Samaritan Pentateuch, and this is a Samaritan priest. And so this uh, this copy of the Samaritan Pentateuch goes back to about the 17th century. Uh, you can see this in uh, uh, Strauss's Four Portraits, One Jesus. It's on page uh, 287 if you uh, have the physical copy, uh, but otherwise it's just in the, the chapter on Luke, and you'll be able to see this. So um, Luke seems to be particularly interested in Samaritans. Then also women. Uh, Luke seems to be very interested in showing that, that women are being treated uh, favorably by Jesus. Uh, this is in the other gospel authors as well, but specifically there in Luke. Luke's birth narrative, in a comparative uh, perspective, if we're looking at uh, what Matthew's done versus what Luke has done, Matthew and Luke both depict Jesus' birth in Bethlehem to a virgin, but they differ on the parent's hometown, the wise men versus the shepherds. Only Matthew records the flight to Egypt, while Luke records the journey to Bethlehem. This is one of those places where, uh, you know, uh, scholars of the New Testament will often say that there's a contradiction. Uh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, there may very well be. Uh, and so this is something that we, we need to, uh, take seriously and, and do the work. Right. Um, in my own opinion, I think, uh, what's happening here is, uh, that both of them are indicating what's happening, uh, but they're emphasizing the events that fit their narrative the best. Right. And so Matthew, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, wants to give us the flight to Egypt because it fits part of his narrative. For Luke, he doesn't need to record that because it doesn't fit part of the narrative that he's trying to record. Okay. Uh, also, it's noteworthy that Luke's genealogy connects Jesus with all humanity, with Jews and with Gentiles. Matthew does this as well to a lesser extent, uh, but, uh, but Luke definitely uh, um, wants us to know that Jesus is connected to all of humanity. He does this by finishing uh, the genealogy with son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. So that Jesus is connected universally, not just uh, back to Abraham, but all the way back, 
right? Um, and the genealogy is another place where people are going to argue that there's contradiction. But I'd like to remind you, based on cultures of ancient Civ, which again is an, a prerequisite for this course, uh, genealogies in the Old Testament are, and in the New Testament for that matter, are not intended to be exhaustive. They're there to bring honor. And so you list the people in your family that bring you the most honor rather than listing exhaustively everyone in your genealogy. And so, for instance, uh, you know, my great-grandfather's name was Fred. His son's name was uh, William. Then uh, my father's name was John. My name is Ryan. So we have Fred, William, John, and Ryan. Well, let's, let's say, you know, for the sake of example, that I'm trying to write a genealogy for myself. Um, uh, or let's say I'm doing one for my son. My son's name's Marshall. So let's say I don't do anything noteworthy. Let's say uh, my dad doesn't do anything noteworthy, uh, but uh, William and Fred both do. Well, I'm probably going to write Marshall, son of William, son of Fred, and skip me and my father if we didn't do anything that's actually going to bring any honor to the table in the genealogy. And so this is why they're you know, genealogies often don't line up perfectly uh, because, you know, different people are writing the, the genealogies in different ways, okay? Luke begins uh, Jesus' public ministry with Jesus' sermon in the synagogue in his hometown. Jesus presents himself as a Jewish prophet who fulfills the prophecies of Isaiah, and this angers the Jews who try to kill him. There's a great video about this uh, by Biblical Archaeology Society, the, the speaker is uh, Richard Rohrbaugh. Uh, he does say a couple of things that I would disagree with. Like he says that Jesus was almost certainly illiterate. I don't agree with him there. Uh, but the, the video in general is just phenomenal. Um, I'll post a link for it uh, for this week uh, in case you're interested in watching it. But it, it is not required. Uh, but if you're interested in, in understanding why Jesus begins his public ministry uh with the sermon in his synagogue in his hometown, presents himself uh, as a, a Jewish prophet, and why this angers uh, the crowd and they try to kill him. Rohrbaugh does a wonderful job near the end of the video of explaining how to uh, why this is the case. Okay, and so this would be be really helpful to you, but again, not required. You should, in fact, have watched it in Cultures of Ancient Civilizations, uh, but you know, maybe maybe you didn't. Okay, so so that'll be linked in Moodle for you uh, as a recommended resource. In conclusion, uh, Luke depicts Jesus as a prophet in his birth, his deeds, and his death. As a prophet sent by God, Jesus expects to be rejected and suffer death at the hands of his opposition. It's rejected by the Jewish religious leaders, which allows the Gentiles to experience salvation. Jesus' death, in contrast to other places, does not bring salvation. Rather, it elicits repentance, and this leads us uh, to the book of Acts, because Luke is not finished with this yet. He's trying to emphasize repentance, and then he's going to give us the call to salvation in the book of Acts. Uh, Luke stresses that salvation was first directed to the Jews, but Jesus was rejected as the Jewish prophet. And so Jesus' message of forgiveness of sins and repentance was then made available for all people, Jew and Gentile alike. So for Luke, the delay of the end allowed for a worldwide mission. All right. Well, uh, thanks for bearing with me through this. I uh, hope you enjoy uh, doing your narrative study. hope you enjoyed a little little taste of the Quran. Uh, I think uh, this is one of those things that we should be reasonably literate of uh, when we're uh, studying the scriptures, especially because it assumes that we know so much of the scriptures. And so if you have an opportunity uh, to speak with somebody who is a Muslim, uh, having some familiarity with their text, uh, will be very helpful for you in that conversation. So, uh, as always, uh, if you have any questions, uh, anything comes up that uh, inhibits you from being able to complete your assignments in a timely manner, please do let me know. I'm here to help you. Uh, otherwise, I uh, look forward to see your, seeing your work, and uh, we'll see you next week.